Welcome to the Young Turks. Have we got an interesting show for you tonight. Now, normally we'd go story by story, and we will in the news uh, a little bit later in the program, and Anna will join me for that. But right now, we have a very rare live interview. That's because Bernie Sanders is in the studio. Uh, Senator Sanders, welcome to Rebel Headquarters. <laughs> it's, it's a pleasure to be with Rebels. I like that. <laughs> All right, so uh, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, let me get to it. Uh, almost exactly a year ago, you were down... Only 59 points uh, in the polls. That was a good poll, actually. <laughs> <That's so laughs> uh, and this week, uh, you were within five points of Hillary Clinton. Uh, you've won 12 contests so far. Um, but I've interviewed you in the past, and my honest assessment is that you would have had no chance 12 years ago, 8 years ago, or even 4 years ago. Do you agree with that assessment? And if, and if you do, what do you think has changed so dramatically to put you in this position? Uh, I do agree with your assessment. And I think what's happened is people are looking around the world in which they're living. What they are seeing is they are working, in many cases, longer hours for low wages. Uh, they're seeing that they can't afford to send their kids to college. And they worry very much about the future of their children, who may have a lower standard of living than they do. And I think that is emotionally very disturbing. And then they're seeing almost all new income and wealth going to the top 1%. And no matter whether you're conservative or progressive, you know what? You think that sucks. You think that's not what American democracy is about. And I find a lot of people coming together on that. And, and the other issue is uh, people see a, a corrupt campaign finance system uh, where billionaires are buying elections, and they're unhappy about that. And then you got among the most sane people understand that climate change is going to cause devastating problems unless we get a handle on it and they're upset that we're not moving forward more aggressively. So why now? Do you think that that frustration has built to uh, a climax and with the sense of, well, nothing's ever going to change, especially with the money and politics issue? Well, I think the uh, folks uh, who took on Wall Street uh, deserve some credit for raising the issue of income and wealth inequality and the power of Wall Street. I think Elizabeth Warren uh, over the years has done a great job, and a number of people have. But I think the combination of simple, simply the reality of American life, you know, people ask themselves, why are we the only major country on earth that doesn't guarantee health care to all people? Why don't we have paid family and medical leave? Uh, why do we have the highest rate of childhood poverty? Why? Why are kids graduating college deeply in debt? This is the wealthiest country in the history of the world. Do you really want to live in a country where the people on top have it all and your family is struggling just to get by. And I think that is the reality that people are seeing, and they are saying, enough is enough. Come to the rallies that we do, where we have you know, 10, 20,000 people out. You see the hope on people's eyes that we can, as a nation, do a lot better. So uh, we're going to talk a decent amount about the media here, but Good. Um, one of the things uh, that they say is, well, that's unrealistic. So now you just mentioned that all the other developed countries have single-payer health care and right. have all the things that you mentioned. Right. So why do you think that the media is saying it's unrealistic? Well, first of all, let's start. We're talking about the corporate media, right? And by the way, let me, without trying to butter you up here, let me congratulate you, because we need to break through the fog of the corporate media, which does everything that they can to keep us entertained without addressing the real issues. I'm on the corporate media every single day, and you don't know how hard it is just to try to demand that we begin to talk about the real issues. They really do not want to. Talk about everything under the sun, but not the real issues. Uh, I think what you have is a corporate media, which by definition has conflicts of interest, right? Comcast owns NBC. It's probably one of the most attested companies in the country. Disney is a co-owner. They're paying their workers in Disney World eight or nine bucks an hour, uh, bringing in people from around the world to replace American workers. Uh, these are issues, the important issues that they don't want to discuss. Second of all, the model for media coverage right now is six-second sound bites and an unwillingness to talk about real issues in a serious way. For example, climate change. I have to write a letter to the presidents of all of the networks to tell them that on their Sunday shows, they never talk about climate change, almost never talk about it. Why? Well, does it have to do with the fact that they got a lot of energy, you know, coal company and oil company money advertising? I think it does, but they don't talk about it. Um, income and wealth inequality. Do you ever hear really serious discussions of why the middle class is disappearing, the people on top get all of it? 
health care. You know, I, you see Michael Moore's movie called Sicko? Of course, yeah. And it was a really a brilliant movie. Mm -hmm. But I talk to young people. They don't even know that we are the only major country without health care for all. They don't know that in Germany or in Scandinavia, college is free. They don't know that. Media is not telling them that. So the media is an arm of the ruling class of this country. And they want to talk about everything in the world except the most important issues. Because if you talk about it, real issues and be educated on the real issues, you know what happens next? They actually change. And last issue on that, you think you see NBC talking about Citizens United? I don't think so. Television stations make huge amounts. They love Citizens United. All the super PAC money going in. So I, I was going to ask about that as well. But before we even get to that, um, do you think that Time Warner and Comcast should have to disclose that they are among the top ten donors to Hillary Clinton's campaigns throughout her career? Yeah. Uh, because they're doing the debates, they're doing election night coverage, and they never say, hey, we're among uh, Hillary Clinton's top Absolutely. donors. Absolutely. Look, I think a focus on media itself, and I don't do enough of it. I, I try to, but it's hard to talk to the media about the media. You know, they're not particularly interested on, on that issue. But, uh, you know, I think that point is right. But the demand has got to be for the media, and I, I don't think it, it's going to happen. I mean, these guys can't do it. That's why what you got are doing, Tom Hoffman and others are doing, kind of going around the system and using the new technology is extraordinarily important. I was at Northern um, Arizona State University just the other day. Beautiful campus, beautiful kids. And I asked them, do you understand that there's only one country that doesn't guarantee health care to all people? They were not familiar with that at all. Concepts of income and wealth inequality, concepts of justice, learning what goes on around the rest of the world, very little knowledge, never talked about in the corporate media. So I, I want to give you some examples of, of what the media has done to you. I want to show videos five and seven here. Uh, and I, I've given dozens of these examples on the show, uh, but I want to have you react to it. Sure. Now, there's the, for example, there's the 16 uh, headlines against you in the Washington Post in 16 hours. This is amazing. Um, and then we had Chris Cuomo asking you these questions. I want you to pay attention to how many times he asked you about how you're punishing people in this question. Watch. You are paying for it is actually punitive. You're going to punish uh, people who make money. You're going to punish the financial district. You're going to uh, punish and wind up changing the idea of an open and free economy because you're going to punish them for speculating. Now, I believe that we counted four punishes in there. Um, so how come uh, they never ask, hey, uh, are you going to punish the, the kids of this country by spending a trillion dollars in Iraq, et cetera? So yeah, now, that is, you, got, you asked exactly the right question. Here's, here's the story. I have been a mayor for eight years, a congressman for 16, a U.S. senator for nine years. Do you know how many times people in the media have said, Bernie, what are you going to do to end poverty in America? This is an outrage. We have 47 million people in poverty. What are you going to do about it, Bernie? The answer is zero. Isn't Not that once. Amazing? But that is, that, what is important is not that the media is quote-unquote you know, right-wing or whatever it is. It is they frame the discussion. Exactly. And, and, and that is what we have got to break through. Now, what Chris, and by the way, if you think Chris is the worst, he is not. There are a lot of other people who are a lot more conservative than Chris. Actually, he's treated me fairly well. But on this issue, what Chris could have said, well, Bernie, in the last 30 years, as you know, trillions of dollars has been a massive redistribution of wealth. Trillions of dollars have gone from the hands of the middle class into the hands of the top one-tenth of one percent. Bernie, this is an outrage. What are you going to do about that? Well, that wasn't quite the question that I was asked. You know how often I'm asked that question? And zero. My ideas are radical and realistic, but it is not radical when Wall Street, whose illegal behavior nearly destroyed this economy, gets bailed out. Oh, that's just the way we do things. But to try to help the children or young people afford to go to college, that is unrealistic. So I've got one more for you. Uh, this one is Anderson Cooper. And again, look at the framing here, and I'm going to ask you to respond to it, because no one else in the media asks you this, because they are the media. <laughs> and again, this is uh, CNN owned by Time Warner. Uh, this is four questions in a row. We cut out your answers, because you're already here. Uh, and all on Castro and Cuba. Watch. Yeah, let me ask you about Cuba. President Obama is obviously in Cuba right now, a historic visit. Uh, as president, would you also make history? Would you invite Raul Castro, if he's still... Uh, the leader of Cuba to the White House? So normalized relations for you, that would mean even inviting a leader like Raul Castro to the White House? 
as other leaders. The moderators played a video of you back from way back in 1985 in which you praised Fidel Castro. You said he educated their kids, gave them health care, totally transformed their society. Do you think the Cuban Revolution was good for the people of Cuba? At that debate, Hillary Clinton went after you uh, for, in her words, essentially praising the regime of Fidel Castro. This is something in a general election would, Look, no, would no doubt be used against you. I, what we get frustrated about from time to time is that there's not adequate follow-up questions in the media. So Ted Cruz might say, oh, I'm going to rebuild the military and I'm going to spend all this money. And nobody ever asks, how are you going to pay for that, right? But there you've got three follow-up questions all on Castro and Cuba in an effort to frame you uh, with, with that with that. At uh, a time regime. when the Florida election was taking place, by the way. That's right. So now the Republicans have done a pretty good job in fighting the media. They say you've got a liberal bias, and then they get scared and they ask them about pina coladas and what kind of drinks they uh, uh, you know, drink and how nice they are to their wives. Literal questions that that same right. Anderson Cooper asked. Uh, Ted Cruz and the others. So should you fight back harder and say, hey, wait a minute, you're biased against me and I'm going to call you out on it? I'll just give you an example. Uh, two hours ago, I did uh, an interview on PBS and I had to fight back because I could see where the discussion was going. I was going to get trapped in little stuff there and I had to fight back and take over that discussion uh, to talk about what my campaign is about. And I do that very often. Now, maybe I should do it more often. Maybe I say, hey, shut up. What you're talking about is irrelevant to where the American people are. Let me tell you what's going on in this country. Maybe I should do that. Uh, but trust me, virtually every interview we do, we have to fight. You know, on this one, I think what I ended up doing is saying what I was talking about is whether or not we think it's proper for the United States to go around overthrowing governments, whether it's the Bay of Pigs in Cuba, whether it's overthrowing Salvador Allende, overthrowing Mossadegh in Iran, or whatever it may be. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the framing uh, sets it up for the audience, and yep. so that's, that's why it's important. Now let's move on to uh, the issue of electability and how the media has covered that as well. So this is really the last media question. Um, so we have covered all the different polls because that's what we do. We cover the news here. And uh, let me show you how you do in the last two polls, but I can go back at least a dozen polls uh, and give you the same results. Um, Quinnipiac poll that just came out, Hillary Clinton actually does uh, – Pretty well against Donald Trump. She's beating him 46 uh, to 40. Um, now, you against Trump, uh, it appears that you have a significantly larger lead. Uh, what is that, 14 points as opposed to the six-point lead that she had? Now, let's go against Ted Cruz. She's got a three-point lead almost within the margin of error there. Uh, you have an 11-point lead um, and against the same Ted Cruz. Now, it's not an outlier. It's not just one poll. I'll show you a CNN poll. Uh, CNN says Hillary Clinton is beating Donald Trump by 12 points. That's good. That is very positive. Uh, if you're a Democrat, you like that poll. Uh, well, are you going to do as well in a CNN poll? No, you're beating him by 20 points. Uh, and then you go to Clinton versus Cruz. She's tied. She's tied with Ted Cruz. That's, She's tied that's with scary Ted Cruz. business. Yeah. It? You're beating Ted Cruz by 13 points. Right. Yet, you know what? I, I'm going to show you one more clip here from the media because... Uh, they talked about your electability on air on CNN, uh, and uh, I believe this is clip eight, the uh, Begala clip. Uh, yes. Let's listen to Begala, then Anderson Cooper, tell the American people who's more electable. Bernie has a, a very powerful message, but I think a lot of the people who vote for him want to send a message rather than pick a president. And I, I, it may be, this is just a theory, I don't have data, it may be that the, the, the violence and the talk, talk of violence at Trump rallies said something to Democrats, like, whoa. We need to pick a president here, not just send a message. And that, that I think Democrats mostly think Hillary is a stronger general election candidate. They haven't been voting that way everywhere, especially younger people. And I wonder if that, the, the level of seriousness in the, in the campaign on the Democratic side just... just it would be interesting to see if electability started to get higher than shares my values. <laughs> now, that's interesting because Anderson Cooper there at the end seemed to suggest very strongly that Hillary Clinton is more electable, even though a CNN poll clearly shows the opposite. Again, why do you think they do that? And, and uh, do you think it's just an honest mistake? No, it's not an honest mistake. It is. I mean, you, here is the example. You have the facts right in front of them, and they can avoid those facts based on ideology. Look, at the end of the day, and I say this without any disrespect, 
Hillary Clinton is the establishment candidate, right? She's the one who's getting $15 million from Wall Street, money from the drug companies, money from the fossil fuel industry, has all the governors and the senators and you know, members of Congress supporting her. Okay, that's who these guys want. They're scared to death. They get scared to death at the idea that young people are actually getting involved in the political process and want real change. The working class people are saying, you know what, we need to end establishment politics and economics and move in a different direction. That is their nightmare. And that's, the, that's what you're seeing there. Senator Sanders, are you charging that these multi-billion dollar corporations that run the media might be part of the establishment? That's a hard one, Jake. Why do you ask me such hard, difficult questions? <laughs> that is the establishment. And, and by the way, you know, when I talk, you know, in, in, in most of my speeches, I say, look, we're taking on powerful economic interests, we're taking on Wall Street, we're taking on the entire political establishment, and we are taking on the corporate media. And the corporate media is right in the middle of this. And all of my speeches, what I tell people is, don't accept the status quo or the options. You know, sometimes people will go, well, Jack, as, as you know, we have a very large deficit, and, 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 and you know, uh, we have to cut. Now, do you think we should cut Social Security or Medicare? I, I really want your honest opinion on that one. <laughs> Those are the options that you're given day in and day out rather than saying, mm, well, actually, maybe we should ask the billionaires to stop paying their fair share of taxes or in tax loopholes of corporations. Never part of the discussion. So now let us uh, move on to those harder questions. Uh, now, a lot of uh, people in the, in the movement have decided that you are their leader, <laughs> uh, partly because you're running for president. But, you know, you look at uh, some recent polls of millennials. Uh, they have you as by far the most popular politician. But they actually have you as more popular as a person they'd like to meet above Beyonce. Okay, <laughs> oh, that's a hell of a thing, right? Yes. <laughs> um, but you have convinced them that Hillary Clinton is the establishment candidate. If you were to lose and the Democratic Party comes to you and says, okay, now take this movement that is full of energy and is against the establishment and make sure they vote for the establishment candidate, what do you say? Well, you know, what I say... Number one, I, I'm not as big into being a leader. You know, I, I much prefer to see a lot of a lot of leaders and a lot of grassroots activism. Number two, what we do is together as a nation, as a growing movement, is we say, all right, if we don't win, and by the way, we are in this thing to win. Please understand that. Um, what are this, the Democratic establishment going to do for us? No, oh, that's interesting. All right, for example, right now. Uh, you have a Democratic uh, establishment which has written off half the states in this country. You know that. Mm -hmm. And they have given up on the state, in the South, the Rocky Mountain area. Are they going to create a 50-state party? Are they going to welcome into the Democratic Party the working class of this country and young people, or is it going to be a party of the upper middle class and the cocktail crowd and the heavy campaign contributors, which to a significant degree it is right now? You know, I, I've talked to Democratic Party leaders and said, you know what? Instead of going around and raising all kinds of money from wealthy people, why don't you meet in some football stadium and bring out 50 or 100,000 people, bring the damn Senate in there, Senate Democrats, and start talking to people and ask them what they want you to do. How about that? Kind of radical. So in other words, if I can't make it, and we're going to try as hard as we can until the last vote is cast, we want to completely revitalize the Democratic Party and make it a party of the people rather than just one of large campaign contributors. Now, normally, uh, politicians would ask for something for them, a uh, cabinet post, et cetera. What would, but I, I, I'm going to assume that whether you are going to ask for that, or I don't know, and you wouldn't say here. Anyway, let's assume for the moment of uh, being that you're not going to ask for that. If you're going to ask for policy positions, as you just indicated, what are the policy positions that, that you would want? Okay. Uh, I want uh, Secretary Clinton, if she's the nominee, to come out for a Medicare for all, single-payer health care system. Uh, I want 15 bucks an hour as a minimum wage. I want to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. Flint, Michigan is not the only community in America that doesn't have safe drinking water. Our roads, bridges, rail system is in disrepair. Uh, I want a vigorous effort to address climate change. I mean, I mean, I am very worried. I mean, I talk to these scientists. This planet is in serious danger. And you can't cuddle up to the fossil fuel industry. You've got to take them on. And also, what is resonating, and I believe very important, making public colleges and universities tuition-free, 
Wall Street tax on speculation to pay for that, ending all these corporate loopholes. Those are some of the demands we make. So if the Clinton campaign were to promise you that they would take significant action in some of those areas, the question is, would you believe them? And so let, let, me, let me run specific uh, things by you. She says now that she's against the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, she had been previously in favor of it. When she becomes president, do you really believe that she will maintain this position and be against TPP, or will she flip and sign that agreement? Well, you know a guy named Tom Donahue, who's mm -hmm. the head of the Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. Basically, what he said is, don't worry about what you said in the campaign. She's just trying to match Bernie Sanders. If she's elected, I think she'll be okay on the TPP. Did you, did you read that? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. what do you think? Do you think well, she's going to flip on that again? I think what we need is to create a movement which holds elected officials accountable and not let them flip on that issue. That's what you need to do. And how about money in politics? Now, here's a family that has uh, raised a billion dollars between Bill and Hillary Clinton uh, for their uh, campaigns. Uh, they have raised $150 million for themselves personally through paid speeches. Do you believe a, a family that has benefited so much from money in politics is realistically going to fight, and you're going to need to fight really hard to get money out of politics? Look, Jack, all I can tell you is I think that Citizens United is one of the worst decisions ever rendered by a Supreme Court in American history. I think we got to overturn it yesterday. I think we need to move to public funding of elections. And that's one of the reasons that, one of the ways we revitalize American democracy. I mean, you've asked a very fair question, but I'm not going to answer it right now. And you're asking me to speculate on her intentions and so forth. All I can say is we need, win or lose for me, a political revolution which starts electing people who are accountable to the working families of this country. Well, let's stay on Citizens United for a second. Merrick Garland uh, has been appointed um, by or nominated by President Obama for the Supreme Court. In speech now, he seemed to back Citizens United. Now, some say, well, you know, there was that precedent already existed, but he actually went further and said that there should be unlimited contributions, let alone unlimited expenditures. <laughs> so you've said that, uh, that you would have picked someone else. Yes. Uh, if he does get confirmed, are you confident that he would be against Citizens United? No, no. I mean, based on what you just told me uh, and what we know to be the case. Uh, what I have said is, you know, the president has the right to nominate whoever he wants, and I will support that nomination. And what the Republicans continue to do is to obstruct, 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 and that is absolutely wrong. But if I am elected uh, and if uh, Garland is not seated, what I would do is ask uh, him to step aside and ask the president to withdraw that nomination. So Are that you I... confident that President Obama would withdraw the nomination if you asked him under those circumstances? Well, who knows? Yeah, I think he would. I mean, I think if he is no longer the president, I think uh, he would understand and not quite prop up that I'm left with somebody that he nominated as opposed to somebody who I nominated. And I will tell you this. Let me be 100 percent clear. I will not nominate anybody who isn't straightforward and public about saying that person, that nominee, will overturn Citizens United. That is my litmus test. Right. And how about President Obama himself? Do you think he's done enough to get money out of politics? No. Look, I mean, I think I like the president. He's an incredibly smart guy. He has faced more obstructionism, and obviously because of the color of his skin, he has faced the kinds of disgusting opposition that is disgraceful. Um, I think, you know, that uh, money in politics is the major political crisis that we face right now, and uh, I think he could have done more. I mean, he's clearly against Citizens United, no question about that, but I think he could have been more forthright and uh, stronger in his opposition. Do you think President Obama is the establishment or is fighting against the establishment? I think probably both. I mean, I think he's... You know, do I think he has real views and real concerns deeply felt? And I think he does. You know, unlike some people, you know, who will go with the wind all the time. I think, you know, for example, closing down Guantanamo, not a popular position. He believes in it. He does believe in it in his heart and soul. Um, you know, I think he gets very disturbed about the number of people we have in jail. Uh, it was brave of him to go to a jail. First president, long time, actually visited a penitentiary beginning the process of trying to lower our disgracefully high jail population. 
Yeah, I think, you know, I, I like him. I think he's a decent guy. But on the other hand, you know, it is not, uh, as Hillary Clinton reminds us, he actually got more money from Wall Street than she did. That was her excuse. Hey, I get money from Wall Street, says Hillary, but Barack Obama got even more. Well, you know, uh, do I think, for example, uh, he stood up to Wall Street in the way that he should have? You know, as I go around the country and speak to people, a lot of things get them angry, but nothing gets them angrier than the fact that some kid smokes marijuana today, gets caught with marijuana, that kid gets a prison, gets a, uh, a, a prison record, right? That's what happens. But what happens if you're a banker on Wall Street and you destroy the American economy because of illegal activity? And you pay, by the way, if you're Goldman Sachs, $5 billion in fines. $5 billion in a settlement with the federal government. And how many of these people are going to get criminal records? Zero. And that, that shows the American people the corruption of the system. And so that happened under Bush, but it also happened under Obama. Yes. Now, the president will tell you, as he's told me, that, look, what they did was atrocious and horrible. It wasn't illegal. I'm not so sure. Okay. So now Hillary Clinton has started to turn already to the center. Now, you can tell that because during the debates with you, she constantly uh, used President Obama as a shield, as you just alluded to. Oh, Obama did it too. Obama did it too. Are you criticizing Obama? Right. And, um, and there's a lot of reasons why you would do that for political reasons in a primary, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you have been uh, slower to criticize President Obama, in my estimation, than you have been in the past. Okay, so I'm going to keep it real on that front. Now, having said that, it appears she's now done with that, because at that, her APAC speech, she bragged about her p policies b to the reporters being more muscular than <laughs> President Obama. And she said that she would immediately have Netanyahu over to the White House if she's president, setting up a contrast between herself and President Obama. Right. So it appears she is running what, to what the Washington would call the center, what I would call the right, uh, now that she thinks she's on to a general election. One, is that condescending that she thinks she's done with the primaries? And two, what does that tell you about Hillary Clinton well, if her positions are ready to shift uh, depending well, on the politics? But that's been the criticism uh, of Hillary Clinton from day one, and that is why, frankly, a lot of people don't trust her. I mean, you know, people say, oh, she's running against Bernie Sanders. Suddenly she's against the TPP. Suddenly she's against the Keystone Pipeline. Suddenly she wants to raise the minimum wage. Suddenly she wants to do this. Suddenly she wants to do that. She sounds like Bernie Sanders, and your point is, well, now she thinks she's won. Well, I don't think she has. Now she's doing something different. Uh, in terms of Israel, I gave a speech. I couldn't make the APAC thing. I really wanted to do it, but I was in the, the West Coast. Um, and my speech was very different than Hillary Clinton's. I am 100% a supporter of Israel's right to exist. I was on a kibbutz for a number of months when I was a young people, a young person. Do uh, they really question that with you? Do they, so you're the first Jewish candidate to ever win a primary in American history. You've won 12 contests. Do people think, well, I'm not sure you're sufficiently pro-Israel? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, on the other hand, what I understand is that in Gaza, unemployment is 44%. That community is, remains in destruction. There's massive poverty, massive water problems, massive problems. You cannot be a president of the United States without understanding that. I don't know how you bring peace to the Middle East if you're just one-sided. You've got to embrace both people. And as a Jewish person, I have found, and this is so disturbing, so many similarities between Palestinians and Jews. Under proper circumstances, people can and should get along, get along. I did some years ago. I got some money, and I brought, had a conference with um, a number of the people, a number of people from the Arab countries and Israel. You know what we talked about? Not politics. We talked about water, which is a huge crisis in, in that part of the world. And you had intelligent people sitting down. What do we do? How do we solve this problem? You know, I think it can be done, uh, but I was not happy with the Clinton speech. So, um, by the way. Uh, uh, you had more Muslims voting for you in, in places and in states like Michigan. Yes. Uh, are you proud that as a Jewish candidate you got an overwhelming majority of Muslims to vote for you in America? It, that is the best of America. And I sat down and I met with some of the Arab American leaders in Dearborn and elsewhere. And wonderful people, good people. And what we've got to do, and I don't tell you, Jake, that I have any magical solution that others have not had. Clearly there are awful people on both sides who for their own political gains are fomenting hatred, and there are very decent people on both sides who understand that the future is peace. So when you're talking about the awful people on one of the sides, are you referring to Ted Cruz and Donald Trump? 
<laughs> no, I was, you know, to say the least, uh, probably Netanyahu would not be the first person that I would invite to the Oval Office. Okay. And All right. <laughs> we should probably wrap it up. Okay. So uh, I want to end then by asking you about what you would do if you would win. Uh, so, um, number one, the, the, the Clinton people say, oh, the Republicans are going to fight you tooth and nail. Do you think if Hillary wins, they're going to roll out the welcome mat oh, for right. her? Oh, right. They just love her. <laughs> I mean, you know, over the years, they have just shown their enormous respect and affection for her. And I suspect the day after, they'll probably have some wonderful party, uh, you know, in the Congress just saying how grateful and happy they are that she was elected. Look. Given the severity of the crises that we face right now, uh, what has got to happen, and I, I don't just use this rhetorically, we need a political revolution. And I'm beginning to see the seeds of that developing in this campaign, where working class people and young people begin to understand that it is imperative that they participate in the political process and that they demand the government, which represents all of us, not just the few. So that's what, what we have got to do. I can't do it as president alone. We need that mass movement. What do you do with that political revolution if you win? So how do you get the Republicans to go in the direction you're asking for this is what with that do. revolution? This is what you do. You, the Republicans are many things, but they're not dumb. And they understand that their agenda succeeds when nobody knows what their agenda is. I'm the ranking member of the Budget Committee. How many Americans do you think know that these guys want to cut Social Security, cut Medicare, cut Medicaid, cut education, cut or end the EPA and give hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks to the top two-tenths of one percent. Do you think anybody in America knows that? Well, if I'm president of the United States, they will know that. And what you do is say to things like you get in legislation introduced, for one example, to make public colleges and universities tuition-free with the tax on Wall Street speculation. That's going to come up on, you know, uh, September 19th, uh, 2017, and every person in this country is going to know that vote. And they're going to know who's voting for it and who's going to be voting against it. You develop a grassroots mechanism. So you focus attention on that. You focus attention on uh, the need for a national health care program and so forth. But you have to educate people. and You have to bring the grassroots in a much closer connection to what goes on in Congress. If you win, is Hillary Clinton liberal enough uh, to be in your cabinet? Oh, stop, stop getting me in trouble here. <laughs> uh, there are other people that I would... Uh, probably go to before Hillary Clinton, uh, people like Elizabeth Warren, for example. All right, fair enough. Uh, Bernie right. Sanders, thank you so much for joining fair us sure. on The Young Turks. We Thanks. appreciate it. We'll be right back with the rest of the show. Thank you, guys.